This is the engine for my 1967 Alfa Romeo Spider project. It's in a thousand pieces, and it's been a very long road to get this old 1600 block back into a state where it could even be considered as a viable option for this car. But after a lot of frustration and a lot of work, it's now ready to go back together, and hopefully this time, it's gonna stay together. First thing up is getting the block onto the engine stand, which is pretty easy with the 105 series block as they don't weigh much. This stand allows me to rotate the engine over, but still have access to the back of the block. This is important because the rear main seal and the rear main bearing can be quite tricky to install on these 105 engines. Apart from the cylinder liners, this block was totally bare. So I'm starting with the bottom end with the crankshaft. Now, this crank has been recently reground to its second undersize. That means that the mains and the big ends have been reground by 20 thou. And obviously, you have to fit bearings to suit. I've spent many, many hours making sure that this block and the crank and all the parts that are going back into this engine are very clean and that there's no debris left in the oil passages. But before I drop anything in, I'm going to give it a quick blowout with some air to make sure that no dust has settled on any of this. I like to just oil the bearings instead of using assembly lube. I think assembly lube is really good for engines that are going to stand for quite a long time before they're fired up or for engines that are just going to be filled up with oil and then cranked, but I prefer to oil prime an engine. So no assembly lube here. On either side of the rear main bearing cap, there are two rubber seals, often referred to as cigarette seals because they're long rubber cylinders. I don't think it's possible to install them properly while the fifth main bearing is in place. So I like to install them first with a little bit of gray silicon facing the block. And I like to add some rubber grease facing the bearing cap later. Before the bearing cap goes on, it's really important to remember to fit the thread plates for the flywheel. It's easy to leave these out and you cannot fit them once the bearing is in place. Instead of using the more traditional locking tabs and power nuts to keep the main bearing nuts in place, I've decided to go with high temperature, high strength Loctite instead. It's just a much more modern solution and a solution that won't lose any strength over time. And it allows me to install high tensile washers even on the fifth main bearing. These grub screws block off the oilways in the crankshaft. I always remove the aluminium plugs and thread the crank 
being able to clean inside the crank is really important. There's always dirt and debris inside the crank where you can't get to it. And those plugs sometimes do fall out. So I think the grub screws are better. The rear main seal on this car took quite a lot of fiddling to get it to fit properly. But I'm pretty confident it's gonna work. It is a upgraded high temperature double lipped seal. So it should be much better than the standard one. Just like the oil galleries in the crankshaft, all the oil galleries in the block have been opened up and the ends have been threaded. These I'm gonna seal off with grub screws, machine screws, and my good old favorite high temperature Loctite. These are the timing gears that reduce the chain speed from the crank up to the cams. It can be a bit of a fiddle getting them to fit into the lower timing chain. But once they're together, it's pretty simple to just slip them onto the crank and install them in the block. The 105 series cars don't have a tensioner on the lower chain, mostly because it's so short. But a really great feature about the 105 design is that they do have adjustable cam sprockets. So any slack on the bottom chain, you can take into account at the camshafts. These front timing covers tend to leak. So I'm going with gaskets and high temperature gasket maker. But I think the real trick is in preparation. All the gasket surfaces on this block have been filed flat and given a good key so that any gasket or sealant should stick to them pretty well. Be very careful not to forget the little square cut o-ring that seals the oil passage between the timing cover and the block. With the front timing cover installed, I can install the oil pump, which I like to do with the distributor in place so I can make sure that the orientation of the pump is such that when the engine is at TDC, the distributor points at the front of the engine. The gasket sealing face on the fifth main bearing on this engine was a little bit low because of the line boring. To make up for that gap, I'm installing a little gasket in place with some Viton rubber sealant and just leaving it with the sump bolted on overnight to set. And that should make sure that the whole fifth main bearing, rear main seal, that whole area should have a good tight oil seal and won't drop any oil. The conrods in these engines are asymmetrical. It means you can actually install a conrod backwards. There's a diagram in the workshop manual that shows you the correct orientation for the rods. So according to this diagram, I'm marking the inlet side of each rod with a bit of red ink. That way, when it comes time to install them, I know I need to line up all the red marks with the inlet side of the engine. This set of pistons and conrods has been set up by an engineering shop. They're all matched and balanced, and the piston rings have been gapped to the cylinders. However, the piston rings haven't been fitted. And during South Africa's super strict national lockdown, I can't go to a hardware store and get a set of ring pliers and I can't take them to an engineering shop to have them fitted to the pistons. So what I'm about to show you, I definitely do not recommend. It's not impossible to fit piston rings to pistons without a set of piston ring pliers. However, it's just very difficult and it makes it easy to do something that would either warp or break a ring. When fitting piston rings, what you really don't want to do is twist them. If you twist them, they could break, but they could also just warp ever so slightly, enough that they won't 
be able to turn freely in the piston grooves while the engine's running. However, that said, I'm not willing to wait until our overlords in government let us go to the hardware store before I put this engine back together. So I decided to try and fit these by hand as carefully as possible. And I actually managed to get all of them fitted together without doing anything stupid with the rings and without scratching the pistons. With all the rings fitted and none of them bent or broken, I oiled up the pistons, set the ring stagger to about 120 degrees between each ring and got out the piston clamp to get them ready to be installed into the block. The pistons tap down into the bores really, really easily. And once I got them hooked up to the crankshaft, I installed the big end caps. Once again, using high strength, high heat red Loctite instead of locking tabs on the Conrod bolts. And I just repeated the process three more times and that was the bottom end done. On the flywheel bolts, I opted for Loctite again, instead of the original locking tabs, just because they are not high tensile, they're spring steel, so they do tend to go a bit soft over time. On the front pulley nut, I did put an original locking tab back on because I thought maybe if I put thread lock on this thing, I would never get it off. That front nut had to be done up to 190 newton meters. The mechanical fuel pump for Alpha 105 series engines is powered by two little push rods that are themselves moved by a cam on the oil pump. There are a whole bunch of little gaskets and fittings and spaces that have to go on before the pump itself can be installed. I put quite a bit of grease into the pump itself to try and extend the life of this mechanical unit. Before the cylinder head could go on for good, I needed to check two things with the old head gasket and the head bolted down. The first was that the TDC marker was in the correct position, and the second was that I had enough valve clearance on the inlet side. To check the TDC, I used a piston stopper, which is really just a bolt in a hollowed out spark plug, to stop the piston just before TDC. I made a mark on the pulley where it stopped on the one side and then rotated the engine all the way around until it stopped on the other side of TDC. I marked those two points on the crank with a razor blade. Now, TDC would be exactly halfway between those two points, so I transferred the points to a piece of tape and measured it out, and after doing a little bit of calculation, it turned out that my TDC marker was, in fact, in absolutely the right place. To check the valve clearance, I'd put a little bit of putty on the number one and number four pistons on the inlet valve pockets on the pistons. I installed the camshafts and got them timed up, and then turn the motor over with that putty in place. And when I pulled the cylinder head off again, I could see that the valves were not actually touching that putty, which means that I had plenty of room. So the modifications that I'd done to the pistons had made all the difference that I needed. Since I was happy with the valve clearance and the TDC marker, it was time to install the head with the real head gasket and its six little oil sealing O-rings. I torque the head down in three stages. The first being 30 newton meters, 
the second being 60 newton meters. And the third being 90 newton meters. All oiled, of course. There's no real trick to installing Alfa Romeo 105 cams, apart from remembering to install them with the chain sprockets loose and the locating bolts removed. Once the cams are bolted in and the chain's done up, you can adjust the cams to make sure that they line up with the timing marks. Then put the locating bolts in, turn the engine over on the flywheel, and if you're happy with the way that your timing looks after a few rotations, you can tighten up the chain sprocket nuts. Once the cam timing was dialed in, I locked the bolt for the upper chain tensioner and installed the cam cover on the top of the engine. The only thing left on the bottom end of the engine was to install the sump in its two sections. Since the issue with the fifth main bearing had been resolved, it was all pretty straightforward. Just a lot of sealant and a lot of nuts and bolts. I suppose at this point I could consider this engine build complete. However, in the interest, mostly, of saving some space on my workbench, I decided to go ahead and install the exhaust manifolds. And the inlet manifold, along with the carburetors and part of the accelerator linkage. I went ahead and removed the dummy distributor that I had been using to keep track of timing and installed a new O-ring and the proper 1-2-3 distributor that I'm going to be running in this car. And Continuing with the theme of saving space, I also installed the top of the airbox and the hose that acts as the crankcase breather. And the last part of the whole job is putting in a new dipstick. And with that, the engine build is done. This particular engine for this Duetto Spider has really thrown a lot of curveballs my way. It's been a stressful process, but at least now it's done. And it's done in such a way that I feel really confident that it's going to be a great engine. Now that this particular set of problems is off my workbench, it just means that there is a whole new set of problems on my workbench ready for the next video. So keep an eye out for that one. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you all in the next one.